it's time for another Light em Up live show. Uh, it's time for another very special guest who's here with us today. And I'm delighted and honored to see, welcome, and host you all to today's Light em Up Lounge. Thanks for tuning in. As always, for all our dear friends and family watching through the Facebook live stream, it's a pleasure to have you. Should you have any questions, please put them underneath the live stream into the comments. We're always watching, we're always checking, and I'll make sure to forward your questions to our dear special guest for today, Rafael Nodal. Mr. Nodal, it's such a pleasure to have you with us. Thanks for taking the time and thank you for being with us at the Light'em Up Lounge. It is uh, my pleasure. Um, it, is, uh, it is great to be with you guys. Um, I appreciate you, Reinhard, Reinhold, Cigar, uh, Journal, for the amazing opportunity um, to say hello to, to some new and old friends uh, in the other side of the ocean uh, and the ones that are here as well. It's a pleasure and thank you for having me. Mr. Nadal, you, you've been a composer. You've been a conductor for all your life, a writer, a true artist at heart. How does all this, all your artistic background and your personal journey translate into expressing yourself through the art form that is tobacco and premium cigars? Well, uh, first I would like to say to, uh, hello to everyone. I say hello to individuals and some of you before. And uh, Nancy was just showing a cigar. Thank you, Nancy, I appreciate it. And thank you all that, that took time to join us and to learn a little bit. Hey, there's my friend Charlie out of Boston. Hey, Charlie, get to see Charlie many of the, the different uh, events. Uh, listen, um, I think um, everything that I've done, I've done in life, everything that I have studied and I've gone through in my different experiences has uh, helped me to get where I are, where I am today, and to help me prepare to what I am. So I had many failures in my life. I have many great experiences in my life. And I know without every single one of those um, will have not, uh, uh, this moment will have not been possible. I love music. I love conducting. I love creating. Uh, and I think that has influenced me in everything that I do in life. Uh, the way I see life, uh, very optimistic, and also um, how I um, uh, blend cigars and uh, the work that I do on the cigar business. Without that, uh, Reinhardt, I don't think uh, none of this will have been possible. So, Mr. Nodal, let's... Let's go back a little bit in, in history and, and talk to us a little bit about the various steps you took in life. You had a very successful career in, in the medical field. You trained in classical music and, and all that actually coming to America, to the United States via a rather adventurous and even dangerous ordeal from, from Cuba. Um, tell us a little bit about those early experiences of yours and that long journey from Cuba, where you were born, to the United States. Well, absolutely. And by the way, uh, there is a fantastic article that was done by uh, Reinhold and the Cigar Journal magazine that captures very vividly some of these, uh, some of these uh, experiences. And I think, uh, Reinhold, if I'm not mistaken... It was something like from political this is a political refugee to a cigar blender or master or something like that. Uh, uh, and I think that pretty much described, right? So yes, I, you know, I was born in Cuba, an amazing country with amazing people uh, that had been uh, really blessed by God to have an amazing soil that produces some fantastic tobacco and uh, you make a fantastic cigar with that. Um, I left Cuba due to the political situation, uh, was able to live in 1980, left Cuba in something called the Mariel Bodli, where about 130,000 people left in boats in a matter of few months. I, was, uh, I left in a boat, 300 other people. Uh, 
after a few days on the sea, made it to Key West. I was only 15. Um, I came with my mom, my father, and uh, one sister. And that's where the, that, this journey became in the uh, in United States. You know, uh, Reinhardt, when you are a, a, a basically go to another country um, where you are an immigrant, you have to do whatever you have to do. It's just, you know, you're, you, all the plans start again. And you have to adapt. Life is about adapting. Life is about looking at the situation, these conditions, and say, what can I do? And, um, and I started a new journey, continue my music, which I started in Cuba back when I was six years old. I started playing violin and then continue here. I was lucky that I made it to Key West and then immediately we went to New York City. So I just wanted you to imagine coming from a very little, some of you have visited my country. So some of these villages and little cities, right? I was born in Sierra de Avila, it's very small, um, it's a small city, but actually it's a big by, by some standards in Cuba. But I went to live in New York City. <laughs> and that, what a change that is, right? Uh, opera house, theater, symphonies. None of that I had in Cuba and uh, in the town that I was living. So for me, it was opening the eyes to an amazing new world full of opportunity, very scary. But, uh, uh, but it was just, so all of that has uh, influenced uh, definitely my journey in life. So what was it then after all those early stints that truly captured your attention and sort of sparked your imagination when you first came across the pleasure of smoking and enjoying fine handmade premium cigars? I tell you, I remember that day like if it was today, right? Uh, so I, would, I started my journey in healthcare. I, my first job was cleaning floor in a hospital, 19 years old when I moved to, from New York to Miami. Uh, and then um, I, I made it, I became successful in healthcare, became administrator and uh, executive of a healthcare company. And one of my employees, you know, American, Hank Bishop, which is now my partner, Hank, uh, being American, and uh, he said, oh, you're Cuban, you must smoke cigar, right? And I said, no I, no, I don't. Because, you know, what happened is, it, and across, you know, across the world, it's the same thing. You go to Russia, in your case, Vienna, German, everything is the same way. You're Cuban, you must dance, you must uh, smoke cigar, and you must uh, know how to roast a pig. I, I only, you know, knew how to uh, dance, but um, so I Hank invited me to, uh, to this little place in Little Havana, which is a portion of Miami, where's a lot of Cuban immigrants and there's a lot of cigar making. And I met for the first time, a guy by the name of Nick Perdomo. And I met his wife, his brothers-in-law, and I bought my first box of cigar and I smoked my first cigar that day. That was back in 1999. That day, that day, I went to, uh, to my house and I told my wife, I am going into the cigar business. This is what I'm gonna do the rest of my life. Uh, Nick Perdomo, it's a, it has such a, such a personality, right? Uh, such a big personality, love what he's doing, uh, love the, I love the way he explained about the cigar, and he put me in touch with part of my culture that I really had put behind in order to deal with the realities in a new country. And I love everything about that, and I decided that night I was going to be in the cigar business. Didn't know how, didn't know what we'll be doing, but I knew that day it was going to be a cigar for me. It sounds a bit like the the American dream story, right? Coming coming to the U.S. with humble beginnings and then wiping floors and then working your way up the letters. Um, did you ever envision what was about to happen or, or that you were set for, for this 
outstanding journey or did it feel like it happened accidentally? No, no, I, I still cannot believe it. Let's put it that way. Um, but you know, life is, in, is, is a cycle, right? So not only that day, right? I mentioned to you that I went to my wife and I told her that I was going to be in the cigar business. Well, her family, unbeknown to me, right? Had been cigar growers for five generations in Cuba. My wife's family. And uh, they were in the cigar business before. And her uncles, her uh, dad, everybody had been in the cigar business. So kind of that's when I saw, okay, so I think this we have something, right? Uh, but no, listen, the journey for me has been very difficult because I, uh, they say that you learn more about mistakes that you do from, from your successes. And for me, it has been one after another mistake. I thought this was going to be very easy. I have been very successful in the, in the healthcare. And um, I thought, hey, if I did it here, hey, if Nick Perdomo can do it, if all these other Cuban immigrants can do it, how hard can it be? Well, let me tell you, God is a funny God and say, okay, you think you're going to do it. And let me tell you, it has been for sure the most difficult thing that I have done in my life. Uh, but maybe because of that, it is something that I have enjoyed every single moment of my life. And one thing that uh, it was put in for, uh, uh, for me that I really realized when I, you know, what was happening. I remember Rainhold when you uh, very nice uh, put me in the, in the front of the magazine, right? Uh, a few years ago. And it was for the, for the, uh, uh, for the issue um, of the fair, right? Or the inter tobacco fair. And I remember uh, getting to, to Miami, to London, London, Dusseldorf, and um, my distributor back then, the fantastic uh, guy and good friend, uh, Peter Warman, uh, sent, sent a car for us. And in that car, there was a magazine, right? Uh, in the back seat, that it was right direct in front of me of a cigar journal with my face right on the cover. And uh, I called my wife and I said, you're not gonna believe this. Uh, I am here in a magazine. Uh, not sure if they put that on purpose or it was in all the cars that they were uh, picking up people from the inter tobacco uh, fair. But um, that was when I first realized, wow, I think we are going in the right way, in the right way. It's, it's really interesting that you described the way you thought about taking your previous working experience in the medical field and then thinking that it's got to work out in the cigar industry as well, right? What were some of the takeaways that, that you took with you or what were some of the quintessential learnings that you've made in your earlier career that truly helped you along the way with cigars? Well, um, uh... You have to understand, I started cleaning floor in the hospital and um, I was just innocent. Uh, this is a job. I continue my music uh, and I said, hey, what do I need to do? So very simple thing, right? Work hard and uh, look around and what can I work and learn and do, do it, uh, continue doing. So from, uh, from cleaning floors, I started different position and I became the director of finance so that organization and then the administrator and then the director of many, many, of many hospitals. So when I came to the cigar and it was very difficult, uh, I think the formula was the same one, was look around, be positive and learn as much as you can, right? Um, and, and that's what I think. The cigar was a little bit more challenging because there's a lot of things that go into the cigar, right? One is great tobacco, great construction, consistency. Then you have the marketing, then you have the relationship. There's a lot of different things that go into that, that I wasn't uh, ready for it or I didn't know. But the formula was the same one. Work hard, learn, and keep going. Never stops. And uh, so that, I think, was the most important for me to, to continue the success. 
And besides the things that you mentioned, obviously, it's a whole different ball game getting into the tobacco themselves, right? The art of blending and taking some of the the composing experience that you've probably had with your musical uh, previous life, translating that into tobacco. Because you could enter the cigar industry uh, in in a sales or marketing position, but uh, going to the roots and actually creating one of these wonderful products is is a whole different ball game. It is, it is, and I struggle a lot, by the way, I because you know uh, from from the humble beginnings to the humble continuation was a, was a very different part. Um, it wasn't very easy for us. We struggled. We started with a brand called Oliveros that we purchased, that have been on the market in the United States. It was mostly making flavor cigars. Then, uh, you know, when I took over, we wanted to move into premium cigars. Um, and uh, it, it was very difficult. We were just trying to emulate and uh, what other people were doing. Uh, I was trying to make cigar for other people, and that didn't work. That just didn't work. But it wasn't until one day I realized I was not going anywhere. This is not going to happen for me. So at least I was going to make cigars that I like. Mm-hmm. I normally would make a cigar, give it to everybody. What do you like? If you like it, if more people like this one, I would go with that one. And that wasn't working, right? Uh, so I decided I'm going to make cigar for me. If we sell or not sell, that's... Uh, in material, uh, I'm gonna. I was gonna, you know, fail anyway. So I'm gonna do cigar for me, and uh, that's when the aging room brand was created, which was basically our intent to do just a cigar that we enjoy, that I enjoy. And life is funny. Immediately we got good success with cigar that I didn't care whether I sold it or not. So. Uh, but looking back, what happened in my life, I like to learn. I love to experience things. I love to tell stories, whether it's through music, uh, uh, playing fantastic composers, uh, or uh, uh, composing new, new things. So what I realized, cigar for me, not for everybody, but for me, is just a way to tell the story. It's just a way to give you an experience to share an experience with you and enhance the moment and whatever you're doing. And when I realized that is what I wanted to do, tell stories through flavors, through uh, experiences, then that's when life changed for me uh, completely. So when you're doing that, it's no longer, let's market, let's sell, let's do this, is to create, create experiences. Some that will be relevant with some people, some that will not, but at least, in, as I say, whether it's a music or food that I love to eat and, and, and cook, if I touch someone with uh, uh, someone's heart and experience and, and enhance someone's life in one minute, then everything that I've done is, uh, is worth it. So my background is in, in wines and spirits, and I'm, I'm very fond of the, the sensory aspect of things. So whatever I smell and taste and sample is stored into a sensory database that I then try to reverse engineer into a creative process. How does that work for you? Is, is it a bit like an, um, an absolute hearing where, where you can almost envision the, the end product when you're blending different tobaccos and how did you start building that portfolio of sensory impressions right uh, well unbeknown to me i have been doing that for a long time by eating a lot right so it's uh <laughs> i'm trying new food right so for me that was helpful but i, I didn't know at a time and uh but when i started i realized like you said the wine and the spirit was a very good uh, parallels to our industry so for example I started traveling to Napa Valley here in the United States, where you have in California fantastic wines. Uh, uh, then I went to the Rioja region in Spain, uh, to the Ribera del Rey uh, in, uh, in Spain, to Portugal in the Porto area. I went to uh, Germany in the, in the Rhine uh, area, which is 
from fantastic white wine in France, um, whether it was Bordeaux or the Rhone area, um, Italy, for example, the Chianti area and some others, and, uh, and Australia and things like that. So what I, I really figure out that there was a lot of parallels in creating uh, experiences and, and sensors uh, development on that. Um, so that for me was a key to learn. I knew I wanted to create, I just didn't know how I wanted to create, to create that. So as a music, you know, music is the best example for this. You have seven notes, seven notes, right? And for with those seven notes, look at the music. I mean, you guys are, um, in, in, in Vienna, which I spent a couple of actually New Year's there, fantastic city, right? Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and you have the opera and you have this program with seven notes, seven notes. You create so many types of music or Munich, you know, when I, I was dancing that fantastic German music, it is part uh, of different creation with only seven notes. So for me, the cigar was the same thing. Uh, most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, I start from zero, blank, no preconceived ideas of what I want. And then let's see where the, the search process uh, takes us. And, um, and it's, it's very similar for wines, for uh, other, other, um, other liquors, and especially for music, I believe. You briefly mentioned Nick Perdomo, who had a, a tremendous impact on your career in the cigar industry. Who are some of the other fellows and probably even mentors that helped you drive your cigar story and, and your career with tobacco in that sense? Well, I, I am in here because I am really a fan of the cigar industry, right? I love what, what people do, right? I smoke a lot of cigars. My wife will say that way too many cigars. She's a doctor, so she thinks that it's too many. But half of the cigars that I smoke every day are other people's cigars. One is because I want to see what they're doing, but more than anything is because I enjoy what they're doing. For example, the other day you have Benji, Benji over here in, in this uh, fantastic uh, uh, program. Uh, Benji is uh, by any standard, right? A, a master. Of, of tobacco, master of cigar. But then you have people like Ernesto Perez Carrillo, a friend of mine, a person that I look up to, that um, I try his new blends, he tried mine. Uh, you have people like Lito, like my, my partner, Hochi Blanco in Dominican Republic, that was very influential as well. Uh, people like the Placencia family that now uh, finally uh, they launched their own, their own uh, brand, which I was involved from the beginning. The, the Alma Fuerte. Then, then you have the Olivas. What an amazing journey and, and family of that. Obviously the Padron, which had been very influential in all this. So I, all of these people, you got Rocky Patel. I mean, look, what a story. A guy that came from zero background on that and has been able to make a name, not only in the United States, but internationally, or cigar. And then you have someone like A.J. Fernandez, which has uh, Thanks to him, we're smoking this cigar, uh, fantastically rated. Uh, and AJ has also touched me, helped me, uh, and, and uh, enhanced my, um, my ability. So all of these people have touched, and I'm sure I leave in many behind, by the way, um, that may or may not still in the industry, like the CAO family before, and, uh, and even some of, the, some of the people in charge of uh, CAO, and some other fantastic brand uh, uh, still in general cigars and things like that that are doing a fantastic job. I believe uh, we have so many stars in the industry that all of them, little by little, have touched me and have enhanced who I am today. And not only have they influenced you, but you now work with quite a few of those other icons of the industry. Oh, yeah, that's, that, that is... That is beyond my, my imagination, right? So when I'm sitting with Ernesto Perez Carrillo creating a blend that we did for, it was called Oliveros All-Star, or, uh, you know, uh, or with A.J. Fernandez now creating uh, the A.J. Room Quattro. I cannot believe this. So many times I have to like, uh, 
these people are listening to what I'm saying. It's, it's beyond my comprehension. Uh, for me, it's like a kid in a chocolate, right? In a chocolate factory. It's, it's just like unbelievable. These people listen to me. I, I you know, or listen, I have many other uh, friends on the industry. The people like my father have uh, uh, also influenced uh, Pepin Garcia. Uh, so some of these people have come and say, try this cigar. What do you think? I say, you want my, you want my description? You are a master. Um, yeah, for me, it's, uh, it's, it's an amazing thing. So you work with quite a few of these people that we mentioned. You work with different factories, but you always have to graciously wave it into a cohesive overall experience and an experience that has Raphael Nodal written underneath it. How do you manage these different moving elements and still always equip and provide it with a unique Nodal signature? Right, uh, and that's a very interesting, right? Uh, but I think, again, that my music and my, 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 uh, my uh, background in music has really helped me to get to that level. Because, you know, in music, you start learning, like I did violin on your own, but then you go to school and then you have to work with others and play together. So it doesn't matter how good you are, if it doesn't sound good together, you're not going to get anywhere. Um, you may have a, a fantastic composition, but if you don't execute it well, it's not going to happen. People are not going to like it. So I, uh, and then, by the way, then you've seen so many musicians, right, uh, um, that later on in their life, they work with some other people and you see the duels and all those things. Uh, so I think that um, cigar people, for the most part, are very independent. They know what they are. But I'm a musician at heart. And, and, and I know what it takes to work together and do that. But I have my vision. I have a vision of what I want to go and I want to do. And I listen and I learn. But at the end, it's a vision that I try to, to promote and I try to create. Uh, and, um, and, and, you know, to, to everybody's uh, um, uh, has appreciated that and has led me at the end to that vision. But uh, by Every single aspect of it is a collaboration. It's a collaboration that you work together to a common goal. Uh, but knowing that they have their own palettes and they know what they want, but I know what I want and I know what I'm trying. So I, I think at the end, collaborations, uh, someone said before, ah, collaboration, cigar people don't work. And I think they do. It enhances, I think, the final resort from my point of view. Did you also experience um, that sometimes the, the chemistry is just not there or that a collaboration probably does not work because you don't click? Chemistry is everything in life, right? Uh, it's, it's everything. But the cigar, uh, but I have been very lucky. I remind you that all these are people, all these are people that I, I, really revered, right? And all these are people that I are my idols, right? So I always come from that point of view, um, thinking that I'm not worth it to be in the presence of these, uh, of these people. Uh, and I have to tell you, um, I had never experienced a time that, um, uh, that, it, that there was no chemistry. I think I am friends with them before I start working with them. And so far, that has been the key that has allowed us to, because, you know, everybody that knows me knows that I just love life, right? I just love, I am positive. I love, I just love everything. I'm, I'm very optimistic about life and everything. And why get, you know, bothered for little things? So uh, from that point of view, I think uh, it has been the key, being a friend with all of them. And then... A positive outcome and a, and a great result in terms of a cigar is the logical consequence. That is, that that is a key, right? Because I, you know, Reinhard, this might sound, you know, like people say this all the time, but if you don't do things with love, right, it it, it doesn't work. It's you know, I don't care what it is. You might be successfully financially, but it's not really. And we are not we are not about uh, financial success. It, that may come, and for me it was very difficult, 
finally it happened. But um, for everyone knows me, uh, everyone has helped me because for me, it wasn't very easy. And everything started with something doing, doing something with love, perseverance, dedication, and then the other will come. And the result is normally something good. Speaking of, um, you're involved with quite many different projects and, and products within the, the aging room or boutique blend cigars portfolio. And of course your role for iconic brands um, like Monte Cristo and H. Upman and Trinidad. Um, what is it like for you to, to work on such historic brands like the ones we, we just mentioned? Oh, oh, oh. I, I, I still do this. Is this real? Is, is this real? Because, you know, uh, you know, I got my little own brand, right? The aging room by any means of the imagination. It's a very small brand. It's a big brand and a small at best. Successful in terms of uh, ratings and, uh, and, and, and accolade, but you know it's a very small brand. Um, but then you gave you given an opportunity, right, to develop some other iconic uh, brands blends, and uh, and I think that's very seriously because it's not the same as making a blend for agents room that you have. Uh, something we're stewards. We, we what we are. We stewards of such amazing brands in in this in the United States that started with a lot of love and dedication and iconic brands many many years ago. So when you're given that responsibility, I take it very seriously. Uh, I work extra hard. I am very nervous all the time. Um, uh, uh, it took me a long time to feel comfortable um, to say this is the plan we're gonna do, and but has allowed me to, to really, uh, you know, a huge canvas. So it's like you painting and all of a sudden you were only able to buy this small canvas, right? You have no money and you make these small paintings. And all of a sudden you get an amazing uh, uh, canvas and, 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 and wow, then, I, I mean, it's, it's a moment that you can either succeed or not and it's been I, I have been extremely lucky, uh, but it wasn't because if it wasn't because I got the opportunity, we wouldn't get here. So, uh, I mean, so sometimes in a year, we do 20 to 30 new projects. Um, um, and that it is constantly, it constantly uh, um, creating. So if you think that for every one of those projects, you do 20, 30 or 40 blends to finalize it to one, um, is, uh, is, is quite a, a, a difficult task, but one can only be done because we have a fantastic team uh, together. That's for sure. Have you ever had any challenges at the beginning to convince the team that you just mentioned that, that you were for real or how hard was it to, to gain their respect and to have them treasure what you do and what you bring to the table? Right. Uh, you know, uh, I, I was very lucky. I, I really been very lucky. So when I give, I was given this position as uh, um, I, I was just giving card flan, blank. And then what I, in, what I encountered was a group of professionals that really allowed me to, to create. And they saw something which is, you know, this type of projects is very difficult to do it by committee, right? So you, you, know, you do some other things in the teamwork, but this is a little bit of uh, of, uh, of single vision sometimes, but having the opportunity to have so much knowledge on the team as, and, and people like the group of the maestros in Dominican Republic that have amazing amount of time and, and experience of this. So I was able to draw, I have been able to draw from all of those. So uh, no, but I have been lucky. I really never had to prove myself, um, um, never felt the need to prove myself. Uh, that doesn't mean that every project is successful, by the way. <laughs> you, we have a lot more, more uh, failures that we have success. But that's what life is. That, but what, and they saw, I think they saw that I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not afraid to, to, of failure. That's part of the learning process. And, um, and failure is not about uh, whether you sell the cigar or not. That's how we, we measure and many people measure. But failure... It's not about that. 
uh, success on a cigar is if you, like I mentioned, if you can create something that is, it will enhance one person experience. Mm -hmm. um, if that person enjoy it, then it is, it is all worth it. What a wonderful point. Yes. We have a question from, from Ian up in the icy cold UK. Ian, it's always a pleasure to have you. Hi, Ryan. Thanks for that. I'm really enjoying this. It's not icy cold at the moment. It's just been a damp and overcast today. But um, uh, a question, uh, actually really two questions. One about developing your palate. And you sort of said, I think you said it's our but I mean, well, if he can do it, then anyone can do it. I mean, how have you developed your palate? And do you think you have a, a palate or, you know, likely that some of the masters? And my second question is about sort of milder cigars. I'm smoking a Cuban today and it's, it's quite a mild cigar. And I'm enjoying it, but it doesn't have the punch and the flavor of the, the Nicaragua and the DR cigars. I just wonder what your views are about uh, strength of cigars. Right. Um, well, thank you, Jan. I, you know, uh, like I mentioned, I've only been in London. I don't know UK, but I think London is an example of my development of, the, of my palate, uh, which is uh, Indian food, right? <laughs> Indian food. Um, you know, whenever... Uh, you know, I, I see it on my mom and my family. We always eat the same Cuban food, rice, black beans, meat, and plantain. That's our diet, right? But then all of a sudden you, you learn that there are other, right? Are other uh, experiences. You go to Germany, you got fantastic sausages, and then you have regional, regional areas. And then what you realize is that uh, they are a lot more possibilities. And the palates, the, the taste buds are, are like, uh, like muscles. You need to practice. You need to, um, you need to wake them up. And, um, and I learned, I learned in, in, in the UK, in London, uh, that the Indian food, it, it does an amazing job for that. Opens your palate, right? Um, I remember being in the restaurant that's uh, before the, the, the food, they gave, me, uh, they gave me onions cut with a little bit of spices on top. That was the, you know, little onions, raw onions with a little bit of spices. Well, I had to tell you, I ate that and I told my wife, I was Indian in India at the time, was in New Delhi, and I told my wife, hold on for a second, I need to go outside. What are you going to do? She said, and I said, I'm going to smoke a cigar. So I was smoking a cigar right before that, and I have left it outside, right? You couldn't go into to the hotel with that, ITG hotel in, uh, in New Delhi. And I went out and I grabbed the same cigar right after I had an explosion of flavors and wake up of the palates and the taste buds. And what I learned there, which is the theory I had, was that a flavors profile that I have not tasted before on that cigar, I was able to do it now because my palates were awake, were completely awake. So I think that has development of, um, of my palate. Uh, being able to, there's not a lot of studies done in palates for cigars. There's a lot done for, for the liquor industry and the wines and so on. And there's a lot for food. So uh, I, I love Spanish food. I, I learn a lot about the different uh, chef and what they try to do. And, and that has been uh, my development on that. In reference to the Cuban cigar, listen, I, I can tell you that up to today, one of the best cigars I had in my life was a Cuban cigar happening in Madrid in the, um, Fernando's Dominguez, which is the head of uh, Tabacalera. Uh, gave me a, a Cohiba Lancero, which I had with him one evening. And uh, uh, the cigar was very old, uh, had been aged for maybe, maybe 10, 15 years. And until today, that has been one of the, the most ex amazing experiences. Cigars, like everything else, is, uh, is, uh, it's, it's an origin, it's a flavor profile that you're used to. So the way I see it, you have fantastic tobacco, fantastic cigar. As I mentioned, I think Cuba has been blessed right, by God uh, with an amazing soil. 
Uh, but um, it's like everything else in life. You have different origin and you have a different flavor profile. And it reminds me, listen, it reminds me of wines, right? Um, I can, you probably know that until not too long ago, no one in the world said uh, California wines were good, right? So, you know, it was okay, you know, in France, you go, you want to, you know, French uh, wines or Italian less uh, and, and all of those things. But all of a sudden, Germany, I mean, and, so, and German wines, the same, the Spanish wine, but all of a sudden, uh, Napa Valley, uh, especially California, received some amazing ratings and things like that. I think it, it is just from my point of view, it is just, I think the word in Spanish, but I don't know the translation, is abanico, which is a, a, a range of flavor profiles that open up. And then instead of being here, now you have many different notes and many different things that you may or may not. And a lot of depends where you are into development stage. But uh, listen, um, a Cuba, Cuba tobacco is uh, it's an amazing, it's an amazing thing. So it's it's all in the moment, it's all in your personal development stage and, and taste buds. Uh, some of us, I remember when I started the cigar industry, uh, it was all about a strong cigars, right? So Reinhold, you remember, right? It was just a stronger cigar you can get. I remember someone, I was having a cigar with someone and they got, he told me, wow, this is a great cigar. It made me vomit. That an amazing cigar. So, wait a minute, how can a cigar that make you vomit can be, oh, it's strong. Well, that for me is not what a good cigar is. But so it depends where you are right now in the United States. We went all the way. I remember going to Russia, in the first uh, uh, Russia events that I did in Moscow and St. Petersburg, and they, they will say, oh, your cigars are too aggressive, right? So too strong because people were not used to that level of, uh, of, uh, of body in the cigar. So I think at the end, it's all on the flavors and in the notes and what you want you what you enjoy. Thank you. I mean, I like Indian food as well, and we have a lot of it over here. And uh, I also like the raw onions. I'm, I'm not sure I'd take raw onions before a cigar, but maybe. I well, try. but try it one day. I mean, I was happy to happen that I was smoking that cigar before, right? And then after. By the way, it was raw onion with some spices and curry spices and things like that, just like that dry spices on top. Let me tell you, it opens your palates that are amazing. You will taste. Trust me on that. Try one day. Hope it works for you the same. You will try. You will taste notes and that you didn't know that cigar was possible to provide. But it is all that your your palates are all the sun very, very um very open. Thank you. And I probably need to smoke more cigars to develop my palate, but um, I'm not sure my palate is well, I, I smoke about 15 to 20 a day. So yeah, it is. Oh. Uh, <laughs> this is about my 11th cigar today. And I'm slowing down yeah. because of the conversation. <laughs> Ian, many thanks. Uh, we had a question from Reinhold. Please fire away. Uh, thank you very much. Raphael, I have a sort of business-oriented question. Uh, with Imperial Tobacco um, selling uh, their premium uh, cigar divisions to do the two different companies, how do you think it will affect your work and the direction of Altadis uh, USA, especially when you, when you have in mind that the factories were sold to a different company than the brands. So <clears throat> Monte Cristo uh, and all these iconic brands are now owned by one company, but the factories that produce those are now owned by a different company. Do you, do, did you, uh, I'm sure you were in meetings and, 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 and you're, you're brief, but, but can you elaborate a little bit and how this will go together in the future? Right, so perhaps Rainhold, uh, I might not be the right person to answer this, but I can tell you that uh, nothing will change. The idea is to continue making fantastic cigar in, in the same factories, which we are, 
I think if anything, um, the, the separation of Imperial um, will help us because Imperial had, you know, it's, it's a different company with different, uh, fantastic company, but a different vision of what uh, cigar is. Cigar, cigar at the end, rain hole, is, uh, is a luxury item, right? It's says, uh, you know, it doesn't matter how much it costs, it's how much you can provide in terms of the product itself. And, and I think within our company, we have an amazing uh, amount of people with am amazing talent. And I think if anything, if you have to ask me, if you ask me, you know, what an impact is, well, I can tell you that I think it's gonna be better, it already is, um, because, um, uh, you know, our vision is to make the best cigar we can uh, and provide the best experiences we can. Um, uh, who oversee at the end this part of the business of others? It's no other than, it's no different than when we go and make cigar with Aja Fernandez, right? Or we make cigar with Placencia. We, we don't own those factories, but we, we have a great partnership. At the end of the day, it's about the relationship. It's about a common vision of where we are. And if anything, it will, it will improve our um, uh, ability because we'll be more agile, right? In business, you, read, you need to be more agile and it's a smaller company turns to be that. And our focus is premium cigar. We think about cigars when we wake up and during the day and when we go to sleep. And um, it's, you know, now it's a group that only thinks about that. So uh, although again, I may not be definitely the, the best person to, to, to talk about that from my point of view and my vantage point, it's, it's already is, uh, we are extremely excited about what is happening. Uh, second question. So both owner companies, uh, the ones for the factories and the, and, and the ones for the US business, they already <clears throat> are in contact and willing to work together smoothly as it used to be before, I guess, right? Well, I can tell you business has continued the same, right? So that's okay. the right answer and, uh, and improving that. So yes, I, you know, um, again, I'm not the right person to perhaps say that, but I can tell you that from where we are, it's, it's definitely, um, it's definitely um, a huge opportunity. And, and we are in our end, tobacco people like me, uh, we are extremely happy that, that we call this uh, pretty much like independent state, right? So, uh, so uh, we, we, we already uh, know this is, and that doesn't mean that, um, that might not be bumps here and there, it's always in, in changes they are, but I can tell you we are all extremely happy. Nothing has changed for us, nothing will change for us, if anything, will improve, that's for sure. A smaller, more agile, and more focused in the core of the business, which is premium cigar. Okay, thank you. I think that's a wonderful point to discuss, Mr. Nodal, and, and also a great segue when talking about the ever-evolving, changing market situations, consumer behavior, the people enjoying cigars. And we, we had two very interesting questions. Um, one from our dear friend, Charlie, who's here at the lounge with us. Um, he was curious about the business side of where you think that cigar growth is, um, whether it's Asia, the US or Europe. And we had another wonderful question from Gracia over on, on Facebook. And she commented on more and more women uh, enjoying and appreciating fine cigars. So where do you see the evolution? Where do you see the potential of the industry and the market headed next? Well, um, yes, uh, women are an important segment uh, of, our, of our growth, right? Uh, look, we, we see it here, Nancy here, Petra there. Um, perhaps 20 years ago, that wouldn't be the case. Uh, Maybe it was, but it was not. Lately, we have definitely increased in women. Um, women that are very demanding, right? So they want the best, and they want to have the best, and, and that's something we need to provide. We want to provide the best. Um, and, and that's a very, very important segment that is growing. But I think at the end, the, the, the growth depends on us, how we tell the story. Look, if we 
want to tell the story that for anything in life, which is what I believe, it will enhance us. This experience of smoking a cigar. I was with my wife uh, in, an, in a trip to in, in, in Africa, and, um, and we were by the Kilimanjaro. And it was just a wonderful sunset. We had a wonderful bottle of wine. We had a, just a fantastic time. The sun was coming down. It was just amazing. And my wife says, wow, can this get any better? And I said, oh, yes. And she said, no, how? I said, wait a minute. I got a cigar out. I light up a cigar. And I enhanced that moment by the simple thing to light up the cigar. My wife, which is not a cigar smoker, although she has been growing, growing in a cigar family, she's, she saw me with like that amazing moment. All of the sun was got even amazing for me. She said, let me have a cigar and let me light up a cigar because if you were able to even uh, uh, enjoy this even more, maybe there's something here. And that's what we need to tell people. If you want to enjoy life, which, uh, you know, it's not about smoking and uh, smoking is always bad for you, the health and everything. But when you put balances in life and you enjoy and you enhance that moment, that's what we need to do. Cigars are celebratory in, uh, in nature. Cigar is to celebrate the good moments in life when you have a fantastic uh, jackets like Charlie, uh, you know, puts there uh, when he goes to, uh, to the amazing uh, events. Cigars is about friendships, about that. So I think it's a fantastic story. There's a lot of growth. We need to tell our story a little bit better. We need to tell the story, not just have a cigar, because you have a taste of, uh, of citrus and floral and things. No, let me tell you why you should enjoy a cigar. Because whatever you're doing at that moment is going to bring it to the next level. And human beings, especially during these times, we are all about experiences. God knows that we had a lot of bad experiences through our life that, you know, that they just come. So whatever we can do to enhance, whether it's a great glass of wine, whether it's fantastic spirit, either whiskey or some or rum in my case, and some other, it's about experiencing that. So I am very optimistic that once people know about that, and then we tell them the story of how difficult it is to make it, this thing, right? It seems simple, you know, a couple of leaves put together, but so much work, so much love, so much dedication, so many people going to making this cigar that at the end of the day, hey, this is something that is worth trying because if so many people went to a trouble or making something like this, maybe I can, I can try and see what it's all about. I have a question from John, who is here with us at the lounge, and I would so like to bring in John so he can raise his question. John, where are you? Hello, sir. How are you? Oh, there you are, John. Good. Good to see you, my friend. Good to meet you. Um, firstly, uh, yeah, thank you very much for sharing your, your story with us, and uh, thank you so much for the cigar. It is fantastic. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Um, I just wondered, um, very simply, how did you celebrate... Once you found out, obviously, you'd won the Aging Room Quattro had won a cigar of the year last year. How did you celebrate? Um, and what cigar did you celebrate with? Um, well, uh, you know, um, by the way, that was Cigar Aficionado. Cigar Journal got a different list, and uh, which was the way we, we always don't good. But, you know, um, uh, I, I learned during the day when, when that happened, I was happy to be at the doctor. Um, it was a funny story because I, I was having a I was in a doctor visit, had a hernia uh, operation a few days before, and my doctor happened to be the brother of Nestor Placencia, a famous cigar maker, owner of the Placencia brand. And I was in his office when that happened, and um, I was having a checkup, and he was getting so many calls. And uh, finally, uh, he learned that I was uh, I received that uh, that uh, rating, and then then. The, I was in the middle of, of having really literally my pants down and the doctor uh, uh, really uh, um, uh, seen, seen my, my, the hernia operation had gone right. So that was funny on his own. But after that we left and uh, I didn't smoke until about two hours because I went directly to the, my father's office. I had a meeting already scheduled 
I called, I in my way there, I said, and they said, no, wait, wait a minute. Why you kick up your schedule? So believe it or not, my first cigars that I had uh, right after I learned that was a my father, La Opulencia cigar, fantastic cigar from my father, um, um, uh, which is the one, one of my favorites. Uh, that is, uh, is made by Pepin and Jaime and uh, Gianni. And so that was my first cigar in, in their offices. I kept my appointment that day as I had it. And so that was my, uh, my, my first cigars. Fantastic, thank you. By the way, John, where are you, where are you, uh, where are you now? Where is home for you? I'm from Belfast, but I live in Manchester. Oh, excellent, excellent. Both beautiful cities. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Cold, not here, not here. Miami, oh. I, wanna, I wanna tell you in Miami right now, uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit uh, uh, cold for us. Uh, rain hole, I don't know the, the translation to centigrade Fahrenheit, but uh, here right now is about 80 degrees. What is 80 degrees, you will say, the rain hole? Or, or rain hard, which one? I don't know. Roughly 26. 26. 26. So for us, for us, 26 is a little bit cold, right? I want you to see that. Um, so that's uh, that's a good summer. Six around here. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah. So for us, it's a, to smoke outside. It's a little bit windy, and and I live by the beach. I normally smoke my cigar by the beach, but it's too windy today. So uh, putting this perspective with you, John, and Manchester and Belfast, uh, a little bit different. Eh? <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for your question, John and Mr. Nodal. In like in, in fact. Um, Quite a few of your cigars have a tremendous track record of exceptional ratings and reviews. Um, and it obviously has quite a substantial impact on the, the future path of a brand as well. But in regards to that, what, what do you consider the bigger challenge? Creating such a number one cigar for whatever that's worth um, or is following up the even bigger challenge? Because What's after that, right? How do you live up to that expectation and how do you create the next hit after that? It is very challenging to say the least, right? Um, uh, because so obviously, you know, um, you make a good cigar, you get a great rating and you get, you know, you, you want it. I am a very, I, I, I am a, um, a person that is always challenged by continue doing better. So I'm very competitive. That's the word I was looking for. And uh, so I always want to do more. I always want to do more. So, you know, so for example, uh, we have on the last, uh, you know, two or three years, we had a couple of opportunities where we had uh, been uh, nominated by the readers of uh, Cigar Journal in the Aging Room um, uh, Solera, which is a fantastic cigar with a fantastic price, have been nominated uh, uh, for a few times for value uh, Dominican brand, right? And then last year we were not nominated and we're like, what is this? You know, what is this? And when we're nominated, we don't win. And we said, oh, it's, it's okay just to be nominated. And then you don't win. You are, you know, we are all very com competitive. But uh, the difficult things of getting fantastic rating, as you say, Reinhardt, is uh, what are you going to do next, right? What is the next step? Um, and again, now we're working with 20 or 30 different ones. And, and you know, someone have, was having there at, at, Res at Reserva Real Nicaragua and uh, got a good rating. So with the next one it happens, what is the next one? So it's always competitive. But what I believe in my end, that I always that I always said, if someone likes it and enhance their life for me, that's the most. And, and I have to stick with that because otherwise I will die. Because uh, you know, we we cannot make a cigar to get a rating. But at the end of the day, we love the great rating. We great. We love the the accolades and the, and the and the rankings. But at the end of the day, it's a group of people that make a decision on that, right? In uh, in in case of cigar journal, is. Uh, it's the, the consumers, which is, uh, and the people that is, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's even more, more uh, important. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's, it's the people that are having it. And we're not making cigars just for those people. We're making cigars for, for everybody. So in my, 
So yes, it does become challenging. And um, especially, you know, when you got such a success on those, because we've been very lucky. I mean, God has been really uh, good to us, uh, but then it's only as good as next year, what it's gonna be. So, but from my point of view, listen, it's all about life. It makes you work harder, right? And when we get a bad rating, we, we work harder to make it better next time. And that's what we, uh, that's what we do. That's what I personally do. So drawing another um, example or another um, parallel with the world of music, um, what in your opinion separates a one hit wonder from the all time classics and the legends that stand the test of time then? Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, it has to do, I think, um, at least from my point of view, with the structure, whether it's in music, whether it's, I mean, all of you are in a continent that has given us music, right, uh, for many years. It's hard to talk about any, any, any fantastic uh, um, uh, uh, composer without mentioning Vienna, right, or, or things like that. So, but at the end, at the end, you see the you may like one piece more or the other, but at the end is the characteristic of that compositions and the, the movement at the time, whether it's a waltz or, or any other or any other like that. Uh, so I think more than getting a one-time hit, which it can happen to anyone, uh, the idea is to to create a philosophy, whether it's in your music. Uh, we, then you have the technical component of that music. The same thing is for the cigar. You have that technical components uh, of construction, of balances, and flavor profiles, and then you continue. If you believe on that, and by the way, many times we change this because our palate, it, it does change. You also like in music, right? So if you look at a composer like Beethoven, he started very different uh, from, from when you have these uh, last symphonies and uh, grandiose things like that. So we all go to the growth of that. But I think at the end is the, the, the mechanical characteristic of uh, techniques in a cigar. That's what it makes a long term. And that's why people like the Fuentes, like the Lito Gomez, like the Néstor Pérez Carrillo, Oliva, Padrón, Perdomo, all of these people, uh, it's, they're not one time here, right? They continue with their, their vision and characteristics, and that's, that's, that's the difference. You may like a Fuente cigar or not. You may like an agency room cigar or not. But then you have to say, is this a well-made cigar? If this has a balance, it's not bitter, it's this and this and that. Those are some characteristics that always have to be there that define the brand and your vision. And then we'll talk about success or not. So, so maybe that, that's a bit of a philosophical question then, but would you say, speaking of technique and mastering certain tools of the trade, is creativity then an innate process that you, a quality that you have, that you're born with? Is it something that you can train over time? When, when you create something new, where does that spark? that imagination come from? Is creativity something you can learn? Well, I mean, that's a really philosophical thing, right? Um, and I think from my point of view, I'm very humble opinion. Uh, creativity is a gift you get from, from, from God. It's, it's, you're born with it, right? Can it be present at different moments in your life? Absolutely. Uh, can can uh, you learn to develop that? Absolutely. Can you learn certain tools to make it better? Absolutely. Because at the end, creativity is no more than your personal need of discovery, right? Uh, uh, and, you know, you cannot be afraid of failure because then if you are safe in what you do and you repeat the same thing, that's not about a creativity. That's about becoming a commercial success. And creativity is by... You know, let your imagination go and let's, let's look for different experiences and things like that. That's why, uh, that's why whether it's in painters or, or 
or, or even composer, musicians, sometimes during the lifetime, uh, success doesn't come because uh, they, they were just not understood by the rest of us, right? They're just so advanced that it took uh, many generations of time to look back and say, wow, this guy was amazing. And so it happened with us, right? Uh, we do happen to get a more uh, faster feedback, right? Uh, because, you know, you go to a store and people tell you they like it or they don't like it. And very simple, they buy it or they don't buy it. That's, uh, that's amazing. Uh, but it's like a musician when you go and, and you compose and then you go and play in front of people and, you know, you got the applause or not. Uh, people throw you tomatoes or not, you know, so that, that is, is different. You get a, a more faster uh, feedback, right, from that. Uh, however, uh, I know people, right, that uh, they all created, they, they are creative people, but it didn't, it didn't manifest until a particular moment in their life. It didn't manifest. You, you got composers, you got writers, right? Uh, authors that they didn't do that book until many years. They, they went and became teachers and this, and that. And finally, one day, because, you know, you have to, it takes a psychological state to, to be in the right place to say, you know what? I'm going to do this regardless of what people think. It took me a while to, to get there. So, yeah, I, I do think you're born with it. I think it manifests at different times in life. Some of the kids you see in the musicians, right? Like Mozart, oh my God, it started from the beginning. And you can see because you're geniuses, you know, right away. But some others didn't develop it until later uh, because uh, they were just a different path in, in life, right? So, um, so I think that's what happened with uh, creativity. It's not for everybody and not everybody, by the way, I am sure that many of us, many people have creativity that they have not allowed themselves to do it, right? Uh, because of circumstances in life, uh, because, uh, you know, you start working, you got a, you got a, a position, you, you, you got married, you, you know, there are a lot of things that tie you to, to where you are. We are lucky. People like you, Rain Hall, things for all of us that have been able to, to work in industry that allow you to that creativity. Uh, but not everybody, not everybody can do it. And not everybody has been put in a position like that. If it wasn't because I got to this country and, uh, and I had to start from zero and there are no preconceived anything, I, I may not have been able to do it. If I studied in Cuba and music and violin was my life, I would maybe never smoke a cigar. Or if I didn't go to that particular moment where I met Nick Perdomo, right? Things, little moments in life that it took me to say, yeah, let's go and meet that guy that makes cigars. Um, and say, or say, no, I'm too busy. Can they have done it maybe 20 years later or 10 years or a year later? I don't know. Those are very questions. So everything in life has to, to all the stars have to align, right? I think, my opinion. I think that's brilliant. And, and not just that all these things seem to come together, but also thinking about the, the various backgrounds and, and those different inspirations, philosophies that come together within this wonderful industry. Um, it, it's brilliant. And to, to better understand that, as, as you wonderfully explained, your personal journey and your musical background gives all of us as passionados, I think, a wonderful insight into not just the physical product, the cigar, but everything that's behind it. And that's what, what makes this industry so worthwhile. Absolutely. Someone just, uh, I it didn't get to read the name, but someone posted there that cigar is like a symphony. And absolutely is, right? Uh, so you have, you have, I mentioned the technical components, right? Symphony has particular structures, right? Uh, the same thing with the cigar. Um, but at the end of the day, what you want is a good symphony that will develop in, in, uh, in music and it will develop in that experience, whether it's the rhythm or the time or the, or the, or the different elements. And we want that on the light. So what, what I look at my cigar is like that, a cigar uh, that stars 
you know, when you light up a cigar, from my point of view, you light up a cigar, I want a cigar that when you cut it for the first time and you have a, a cold draw, it'll give you some of the elements and a little piece of it. And you can say that's part of the first movement of the, of the symphony, right? So you get that little, okay, so you get some, some notes and this and that, not too strong, you haven't lighted it up. Then you light it up. Then you have that aroma that comes from light it up. And that's how you start building, right? The, the symphony. Then you got to the second movement and then you start continue developing those cold uh, notes that you got, all of a sudden they got a little bit stronger. You got a little peppery or you got some, some coffee uh, notes and uh, some, some, uh, some uh, berries notes. And then they start developing. They start right moving them. And then you got to the middle of the cigar. That's when you want a cigar that explodes some flavor. You want all those things that you have been doing, tasting until now, start getting. And then when you start continue the cigar, the development is different. Now some of the notes may already uh, leave and you got some others or some of the beginning notes as well. So at the end of the day, I think a lot of, a lot of things in life is about a symphony, but definitely a cigar is... Uh, it's about, it's like a symphony, no doubt about it. Our dear friend Ray had a question um, in regards to the Solera that you briefly mentioned before. Can you explain a little bit about the, the difference of, of making that particular cigar? So, yeah, 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 yeah. So the Solera is something that I'm extremely proud of because again, remember I mentioned, I went to different parts of the wine areas and one day, uh, in uh, Spain, in the, I spent a new year in uh, uh, Jerez de la Frontera, which is southern part of Spain, where the cherry comes from. And I found the Solera methods. And the Solera, so in the wines you normally have the 2000, 2001, 2002, is bottled based on years. In the Solera methods, you mix all of the years and then you bottle from that. So theoretically, you have some of the Soleras that have been uh, happening. From the 1700s, they have these huge uh, uh, barrels. They continue to mix them. Uh, so I say, wait a minute. Why don't we do that with the cigar, right? Uh, uh, so in the Asian Room brand, uh, I, I concentrate on very old, very aged tobacco. But in Solera method, I could, I took, by the way, that method of getting very old tobaccos is very expensive, right? So the Solera allows me to get younger tobacco, like one-year-old, three-year-old, and five-year-old. I put it in the bell, the tobacco bells, and then age it an additional time together, together. So that what happened is, normally when you roll a cigar, any cigar, including this one, the first time the tobacco meets is when we get this leaf from here, that leaf from the other, and that leaf from the other, and we make a cigar. Then we put it in, in a, aging room and it ages and the flavor marrying each other. So I said, wow, these people may be into something. What if we mix this tobacco before? What if we, uh, we let her sit together and these things of marrying the tobacco, it can happen before when they are uh, together, all of them. And that is what I call the Solera method, which is Goro adjusted obviously because it's not liquid adjusted to the tobacco part and then um, and that's what we started doing and that uh, we were very successful i took four different uh wrappers the same blend we made it with sun grown with connecticut shade uh, out of ecuador with uh, maduro from uh, uh from mexico from the mexico area and um uh, and uh and uh, what was the other one? And Corojo, a seed grown Dominican, a Corojo seed from Cuba. So all of those, the same blend of those tobacco mix with different wraps. And that's what the aging room Solera, some grown has by far been the most popular, which is the yellow one. How do you have to adjust your, your thinking and your approach to blending when working on some of the large scale products and those huge brands that you're in charge of? Whereas Aging Room and Boutique Blend Cigars is all about the small production runs, the limited, the, the special tobaccos with super limited quantity and supply. Yes, yes. So um, 
I think some of the techniques are the same, um, which is the basis uh, that a cigar has consistency, it's well made, and things like that. The only difference is that if we expect, um, a, a, let's say, a larger production, right? So let's say a, a limited production for me in my agent room would be something like 10,000 cigars, 20,000 cigars. But a limited production in such a small brand might be 300,000 cigars, right? So the only difference is that I need to make sure that we have all of those components, right? Available uh, in large scales in order to make the cigar. So you take that in consideration. Um, uh, before in my aging room, I would say, okay, I'll make this if I only have for 2,000 cigars, it's 2,000 cigars, that's all I have. You cannot do that because, uh, you know, it's, it's people expect to have the, that cigar. So what we do is we look at, we then what we have to do is make sure that we have tobacco, that we go through the process of aging in and, uh, um, and, and continue, continue following up that tobacco. And once we are sure that we have that amount, amount of tobacco, then we make the blend. Uh, traditionally, there is a disconnect between the boutiques and the big one, which is quantity versus quality. Our policies, and I think that's why we are being successful with these other brands, is never quantity, it's quality. If the tobacco that I have to make is this tobacco, but it's not where we want it, then we don't make it. We move on to the next level. Um, uh, so it's just the only difference to make sure that we have plenty of tobacco to make that one. But that requires preparation and requires money to buy the tobacco, which the company does, thanks God, have it, and then and age it and produce it in, in large quantities. But the same, the same amount of work goes into making the most exclusive cigar to make it a bigger production cigar that in, in our end. That's, that's a philosophy that we, we will never compromise. Would you say that quantity and quality necessarily have to be two separate ends of, of the same equation? You know, traditionally in many industries, always the case, quantity doesn't equalize to quality, right? Uh, we see that whether you like burgers or you like other type of food, right? However, in the cigar, doesn't have to be the same. That's not to be the same because the same process goes to making both cigars a small production or big production. What is the difference is the, the willingness to make the best cigar you can. Um, the, the willingness to do the work before on the tobacco and not to, not to use the best tobacco you can. And that's, I think, what it is. So in, in our case, I believe that uh, the quality and the quantity that really is really interchangeable and doesn't, it doesn't make a difference. If we don't believe that we have good tobacco to make 50,000 cigars, we don't make it. And if we don't believe we have good tobacco to make a million cigars, we don't make it. What I can tell you is that it's great to work in a company that has allowed me that if the cigar is not ready, we will not sell. We will not bring it to the market. And um, uh, I, I'm lucky. I know it doesn't work for everybody the same, but I can tell you, um, and it, it happened. We had a cigar that we are working. We did the marketing. We got everything ready. We got to sell people ready. Everything is coming. Uh, finance is waiting. It's, it's, it's counting on this to come to the market today. And it happened very early when I joined the company and hey, the cigar is not ready. Uh, my boss, Javier Estade, which gave me this amazing opportunity, said, it's your call. If you don't think it's ready, it's your call. Well, it's not ready, well, then it's your call. Then it's not going to the market. So um, uh, I cannot speak for other people, but I can tell you for us, that now, that doesn't mean, Reinhard, that you're gonna light the cigar, right? That doesn't mean that you're going to think you like it. But what I can tell you, you definitely going to know is that a good cigar. That you may not like it. And why is a good cigar? Because you have aged tobacco, so you're not going to have this, uh, uh, you're not going to have uh, 
uh, chemicals, right, that uh, or the ammonia of the young tobacco. We're not going to, uh, you know, have production problems because we did it too fast. None of that. At the end, it's all about the taste. At the end, it's all about your personal preferences. And that really, we cannot be, right? Uh, you know, so right now, I make cigar with different levels of bodies that I didn't make before because I only make before in my, in my range that I like, which are medium to very full of strong cigars with a lot of body and complexity. But I don't need to compromise taste in order to, to make it a long, a less strong cigar. I don't need to compromise uh, aging in order to make it that. I don't need to compromise uh, a good burning and a good product construction to get a, a lower um, a lower body cigar. So that is is the difference in our case. Brilliant, Mr. Nodal. Before we wrap things up, um, I would love to to inform our dear viewers and our dear friends that we have a. An interesting double feature coming up next week. So we will actually have two Light em Up Lives next week because we're going to do a special with Eric Piras from Sigral and Bertie Cigars in Hong Kong. So particularly for our dear friends in Asia and Asia Pacific, um, special feature at 10 p.m. Hong Kong time. And then we will chat with um, Cigar Coop, William Cooper, joining us uh, later in the evening then for a very fun and interesting chat about all things Cigar Media and his take on the industry. So please stay with us, stay connected, and uh, we will have another wonderful week next week here at Light em Up. Mr. Nodal, it's been a tremendous pleasure and uh, fantastic to hear about your philosophy, your personal story, and your, your journey in the cigar world. You spoke about the symphony, different parts of the symphony, and that is actually something that I, I kindly wanted to ask you for my last question as well. When looking back at your stellar career that you had to this day, all the hurdles that you had to overcome and the creative interplay between the musical background and the cigar world, speaking of that symphony, where would you say along your personal journey do you now see yourself is it merely the oh, oh, oh. opening sonata or the the minuet or a <laughs> scherzo where where do you see yourself right now oh that is a great question uh uh, uh you know and uh when you get to be my age right um and, and you you're not there yet but um you know, you, you start looking back, you know, it's just start looking back in the journey, right? The journey and, and where you are and where you, where, where you go. I can tell you that I, I still think I have a lot to give. Uh, one is because I see myself as a very created uh, uh, individual that it can be, by the way, uh, it, it can be uh, either in cigars or it can be in other things. I have some many others, right? Um, uh, things that I would like to do. I'm writing. I, I love to write. I'm writing a book about my experience coming from Cuba and since I was little and, uh, and, and things like that. So I'm not sure uh, where I am, but I can tell you that I hope I'm not at the end because I still think, I still believe. I wake up in the morning and I look at the sun I look at the sun and I give thanks to God that I have this amazing opportunity. I give thanks to God that I have an amazing opportunity to be with you guys, which I love Europe. I love uh, different cultures. I think uh, the, the ability to, to visit other countries, to visit other cultures, to learn from other cultures. I mean, for sake, even going to Boston, where Charlie is, uh, is for me, is like a... It's different from Miami, so I, I, I enjoy going to Boston, and for me, it's like going to Vienna, for God's sake, or London, or, or Munich, right? I love people. I love experiences. I love to learn. And so if I have to put it in a symphony, I will say I'm in the third, in the third, uh, in, in the third uh, act um, uh, because uh, I still have a, a, a way, a, a way to go. I, uh, I that I am at the 
at the at the peak, maybe. Uh, uh, I hope not, because what I do is I don't take for granted what what I have been and that. I I I, I don't. I think there's gifts from God. I think it's gifts from people like uh, you, Rainho, many others throughout the throughout the my career. People that I met, I give me opportunities. And I work every day. I wake up every day saying, thank you, God, but I'm going to work harder. I'm going to continue earning the, the, the friendship and the opportunities that people like you and Reynold and every one of you that a small cigar has given me. Uh, and I want to work hard. And I'm not going to take for granted this opportunity. So based on that, I, I hope that I can write a longer symphony, change the the structure and add more, uh, more, uh, more cycles to my life, and uh, and, and and at the end is uh, be able to create uh, a little bit more. And and when you have a cigar that I have something to do with it, any of you will say this is not a bad cigar. This is good, and just that it will it, it comes back to me, you know, in this world, and it gives me a strong and forces to continue, continue the sometimes challenging world that we are today and continue, continue my journey. What a wonderful way to end this beautiful interview. Thank you so much, Mr. Nadal, for spending the time with us and being here today. It's been an absolute pleasure and we wish you nothing but the very best for the continuation of your symphony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Reinhardt. And next time, listen, I think you should have a late night show, right? Uh, I, I think your uh, interviews are fantastic. It's structure. It takes uh, it takes you on a journey. Fantastic job. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rahul. Thank you, every one of you that uh, joined us. I took the opportunity to be to be here from every single country that you are. Fantastic opportunity. I am blessed. Thank you. Mm -hmm.